Welcome, everybody. I'm Eric Potashnik, Chair of the Political Science Department, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's event. This is the um, first event of the year in a distinguished lecture series uh, the department is sponsoring on emerging trends in domestic and global politics. The lecture series features leading political scientists who are conducting cutting edge research on the big issues of our times, including the erosion and rejuvenation of democratic institutions. And it's made possible by the generous support of the Herbert H. Goldberger Lectureships Fund and the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs. So let me introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Professor Isabella Maris. She is the Arnold Wolfers Professor of Political Science at Yale. She's written extensively on a wide range of topics in comparative politics and political economy, including democratization and corruption and social policymaking in both developed and developing countries. Her research has received really a remarkable set of uh, prestigious awards, including the William Riker Award for Best Book in Political Economy, uh, the Lawrence Longley Award for Research in Political Representation, and she's a member of the American Academy of arts and sciences. She is the author of many books, including The Politics of Social Risk, Business and the Welfare State Development, Taxation, Wage Bargaining and Unemployment, From Open Secrets to Secret Voting, and Condition Conditionality and Coercion, Electoral Clientelism in Eastern Europe. Today she will be speaking about her latest book, Protecting the Ballot, How First Wave Democracies Ended Electoral Corruption, uh, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2022 and received the very prestigious European Politics and Society Best Book Award from the American Political Science Association. Among the many fascinating questions the book addresses is why incumbent politicians would ever agree to support electoral reforms that might threaten their own political survival. While the book focuses on how alliances in support of reforms to limit electoral malfeasance emerged in France, Germany, Belgium, and the United Kingdom during the late 19th and early 20th century, it also offers valuable lessons for actors who seek to improve the fairness and integrity of electoral institutions today. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, and welcome to Brown. So thank you so much for the invitation to Professor Patashnik. It is such a pleasure to be here and see uh, colleagues. And also, uh, I'm grateful for the undergraduates to be here and sort of and think about, think together for this one hour and a half about these uh, historical cases that actually have a lot of things to tell us about contemporary elections. Um, so just to motivate my book, right, uh, as you well know, and this is a series dedicated to contemporary problems, right, we are all sort of searching for solutions, uh, trying to end electoral imperfections in contemporary democracies. Um, I, I wrote this earlier book, and I'm just going to try to connect the two projects. So before writing Protecting the Ballot, I wrote this book with Lauren Young, Conditional, Conditionality and Coercion, Electoral Clientelism in, uh, in Eastern Europe, right? These are two countries of the European community, right, where we are able to identify, okay, significant electoral irregularities. Um, and one of the sort of interesting puzzles that, that you know, uh, that uh, um, arose from this book was that, there's a very, very um, severe and intense effort to end the electoral corruption in both countries. I mean, kind of, if you just think about uh, the Romanian case, uh, uh, you know, sort of a heavy kind of prosecution of vote buying. Uh, the, the prosecutor, who is now the European prosecutor, right, led a heavy campaign. And by the time we wrote the book and by the time we measured the incidence of these irregularities, sort of vote buying had disappeared. But what had happened is that vote buying was substituted, right, by other strategies, right? So sort of like, so part of the problems of, you know, reforming electoral malfeasance is sort of coming up with a set of sort of incentives that minimize, in a way, the opportunity for, for actors to substitute. So while the kind of the Romanian government, you know, introduced very, very harsh punishments, kind of, you know, for the offer or receipt of sort of, right, small gifts at elections, and this was sort of, right, prosecuted with, um, uh, you know, with jail up to three years, what the actors did sort of once this kind of sanction was in place, they substituted towards other strategies that were not punished by the penal code. For example, kind of the use of social policy resources to incentivize, uh, you know, sort of right electoral, to incentivize the vote, sort of right a strategy that Rebecca has described extensively in her book on Argentina. So the issue sort of right in approaching kind of this question is sort of right, is sort of we have to, un first of all, understand, you know, what is the menu of kind of, you know, strategies out there that candidates can use to incentivize voters in elections, and how do we design 
sort of right, the, the set of policies and the set of uh, institutions that minimize this opportunity for substitution. So substitution was, is important in these kind of cases today, and substitution was a kind of a critical kind of problem um, in the 19th century cases. And again, just to motivate and to kind of to connect the two cases, German, German elections had very, very strong sanctions against vote buying. If you offered a beer or a drink, okay, sort of right, you are punished <laughs> and with five years of jail. Okay, however, at the same time, kind of, you know, the use of employers as sort of, right, brokers, as actors, as agents, kind of, you know, trying to sort of, right, mom, um, incentivize voters to vote and trying actually to pierce ballot secrecy was unpunished. Right, and as a result, we had no, sort of, right, Germany didn't, and I'm going to show you today, Germany didn't have any sort of, right, vote buying in 19th century elections, but had extensive use of sort of, right, economic kind of coercion as the sort of, right, dominant strategy. That was the strategy that was not punished. Which brings me kind of to this question, if you think about these kind of these cases from sort of right, from a broad comparative perspective, and there are so many kind of comparative colleagues in the room, right, sort of right, the issue, this is sort of a very puzzling kind of universe of cases, the 19th century European elections. They look very much like elections in developing countries today. Yet they made at some point in time, sort of right, some kind of transition whereby sort of right, they eliminated and sort of right, and in a way sanctions and were able to successfully sanction these irregularities leading kind of, you know, to programmatic kind of politics in the sort of right second half of the 20th century. And even though this is such an important political development, we, have, we don't have yet, I think, kind of a good explanation of how this came about. So I'm just trying to bring the sort of right, the literature on 19th century uh, elections in, um, into kind of dialogue with, you know, Danny and, <laughs> and, and Don and <laughs> Rebecca and everyone in this room you know, uh, who studies kind of, you know, elections today. So, so right, and kind of, in, and I'm trying to convince you that it is very, very, they are very, very similar. So again, sort of, right, what do we mean? So sort of, again, if we think of a context, right, where there was universal, I mean, with the exception of Britain, right, where suffrage was kind of gradually, if we think of kind of, you know, France and Germany, they had universal man, manhood suffrage, right? So everyone kind of, you know, every male voter was voting. But if we look at the menu, of irregularities, okay, sort of right, they were ample. And as a result, kind of this process that I'm trying to describe in this book, this democratization after democratization, the closing of these loopholes and sort of right, and making kind of, you know, uh, improving electoral integrity involved many dimensions. And it's important to recognize this because sort of as I'm trying, as I will argue, the coalitions for reforms, the incentives to support one or reform or another dependent on the type of irregularity, right? We don't have the same kind of, you know, the same coalition, the same driving force pushing for democratization, what we assume in the literature. No, these are kind of incremental reforms and sort of right, it's really the incentives to support war on and after really differ across issue areas. So what I will try to do today is open up this black box of what was corruption in 19th century Europe? How did it look like? And how did we get sort of right? How did these kind of countries succeed in putting together a majority supporting these reforms? And again, sort of right, if we think about it, right, and this is sort of way that the, the structure of the book, we had the sort of right, the problem of bribing and vote buying, right, more pronounced in Britain, as I, as I mentioned, and less pronounced in, in Germany, okay. We had, I think uh, this is the pervasive problem in sort of continental Europe, the use of the state employees as brokers, right, the policeman, the mayor, okay, the sort of the tax collector, used by kind of candidates at elections kind of, you know, to sort of right, to, to mobilize kind of voters on behalf of sort of a candidate. Okay, how do we stop this? Then we had this issue of voting technology, imperfect voting technology. So right, ballot secrecy was not off, off, was often not protected. Why? Because kind of, you know, the ballot was transparent. Okay, sort of right, it was sort of only regular papers, and so on and so forth, and so kind of candidates could pierce exactly ballot secrecy, and then sanctions voted who had voted for, for the wrong candidates, right? So a difference in the promise. And finally, electoral fraud, right, manipulating kind of the results of the elections after the votes were cast. Okay, so, so, right, so there was a separate issue of so, right, how could we kind of you know, control this. <laughs> so the, the, the multidimensionality is, is at stake. I'm not going to sort of write in the book, looks at four countries and looks at kind of, you know, sort of write the variation across these dimensions um, and, uh, and sort of write trying to make this sort of write, trying to unpack with sort of write with legislative level data, that sort of write the composition of the majority supporting these reforms. I'm not going to sort of right, talk about all cases. I'm going to kind of crucial on the crucial French case because it has all four reform dimensions. So I'm going to show you sort of right, how the logic applies in one case that has sort of in a way all forms of corruption. And since there are students in the democratization kind of class here, let me tell you something. Right. My motivation. Okay. Uh, my motivation actually is I don't like the theory. 
this. Okay, so I, mean, I don't like, I mean, you know this theory now and everyone in this room knows it, I just don't like the idea that somehow we think we're going to explain democratization or suffrage expansion by invoking some kind of long-term considerations about taxation 50 years down the line and sort of right and kind of and thinking that legislators really anticipate this and as a result kind of they take the decision today and now based on sort of right whatever the tax rate will be. This is to me such a long <laughs> causal chain that needs kind of documentation at every point in time and that we don't, not, no one does this. So I really think we are at this point in time where we actually have to you know, sort of kind of really question this and try to, try to think if we can come up with an explanation of some sort of elite decisions to extend the suffrage in different ways with different imperfections that doesn't invoke this kind of these considerations about redistribution. And I know this, I'm talking to you because you probably have heard this kind of theory. And to me, this was just the fact that we have 20 years after the formulation of this theory and we still don't have sort of right an alternative, something electoral, something more direct, something that thinks about incentives rather than sort of right future of the distribution is to me something sort of <laughs> uh, quite a thing that sort of I still sort of I cannot uh, kind of understand, you know, how we are. So I have been trying for many years to sort of right to grapple with this. And, you know, and, uh, I was always told, oh, just don't even try it. I'm kind of theory is so powerful, it will be wrong. And I'm not saying I'm proposing an alternative here because. I'm not talking about democratization, I'm talking about the subset of reforms that limit corruption, but I just want to open up the conversation about sort of right, how to think about incentives to change electoral reform that does not involve something about you know, taxation in, uh, in 100 years. Okay. So that is sort of my big kind of, you know, meta -critic. Now, where are we in the literature? Well, there's not much, if you think about this, sort of right, what are the building blocks out there? We're still sort of going through you know, the old kind of modernization framework. And maybe there, so there is a sort of right, I mean, again, which you know from the literature, and there is an, an effort to, in a way, to update this sort of right, and kind of in the case of the reforms limiting the fraud by, you know, Susan Stokes and Ted Dunning in their book on sort of right, on what, uh, what ended, you know, go by in, in Britain. Uh, so in their broader book on kind of electoral client, there's more like this historical chapter, you know, trying to understand sort of right, uh, how about buying it? And this sort of right, the modernization argument. This is a modernization story of the type, well, there was economic development that increased the cost of gold buying, right? Sort of it made it very, very expensive, okay, sort of right, for these brokers, okay, sort of right, to bribe. And as a result, kind of, you know, this development itself sort of right changed their incentive. But that is sort of really incomplete uh, if you think about it. And that doesn't tell us much about all the other reforms that I just mentioned before, right? And kind of that may give us some kind of partial understanding of sort of right, the connection between economic development and gold bond reform, but how about all these other things, the sort of right, the, the ending of sort of right, the use of policemen at elections, the ending of fraud and so on. It's much harder to set up kind of a causal chain between economic development. So, so, so I'm trying to, I sort of I'm not denying, okay, uh, um, the um, modernization, uh, and I just think we have to build this in and sort of a uh, richer explanation that also has kind of political incentives. Yeah, sorry, question? I don't know when questions are allowed. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. so, uh, Adam Shumovsky's uh, Democracy and Development, the basic argument is that if you, what, there's 150 countries covered from 50 to 90, and the basic argument is that 75% of the variation can be explained by income. I understand, and that is... That so is, uh, how would you react to something like that? 75%, if you turn it into democracy yes, years... Yes, but that is, so I'm just saying that is suffrage extension, or that is democratization broadly so he only deals with, uh, with, with suffrage. No, no, no. He only, de only deals with contestation, yes. Yes. not the, not the yes. uh, suffrage of the second, second Dalai Okay, so this is, I have written a lot on economic development. I'm not sort of denying it, but that still does not give us the micro level kind of, the full micro level incentives because there's still sort of right, the connection to be made in understanding how development changes the incentives of sort of right, the kind of the competing actors, the incentives of the brokers. Incentives to engage in this reform. So I still think there is sort of a micro link between the kind of the broader macro kind of changes and the sort of right outcome we want to study that we sort of need to open up. So I'm not opposed to, but I'm just. What? Yeah, 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 okay, I'm going to stay here. Sorry, I just was <laughs> carried away.
away by discussion, but serious, this is not a criticism, but just an effort to say that sort of right, working through the micro, and sort of what I'm doing, you will see I'm testing all forms of economic kind of logics, but I'm just trying to build in the sort of right, the additional kind of, you know, political incentives that, that sort of right, that, that need to be sort of right also incorporated in this uh, developmental story. But thank you for, for the question. And land holding inequality, again, kind of, you know, this is sort of right, something, again, that is heavily invoked. And that works, sort of, right? The logic works through this kind of redistributive logic that I'm just trying to say it's insufficient, okay? Because kind of, you know, sort of, right? Where is that electoral kind of politics? So this is where this fits in in the in the kind of in the framework. But again, sort of. Uh, so the four reforms that I will be talking about is the, the reform limiting vote buying. So sort of, right? What was the solution? It was an effort to limit campaign expenditures. The sort of right, the hardest reform um, is the sort of the use of uh, state employees as brokers, and the sort of right, the, the solution that was proposed at the time in the cases I'm studying is the sort of right, that increase in the punishment for kind of a candidate that, that relied on, uh, you know, on, um, on a state employee as broker. Then sort of the hardest in a way, and uh, the, the question that sort of right, took up the most legislative effort was sort of right, how to provide a better protection of ballot secrecy. And the solution was ballot envelopes, um, better containers, um, and isolating spaces. And you want to see the coalition here looks different than the other coalitions. And finally, in the case of fraud, the, the sort of solution that you know, 19th century countries, all the ones that I'm studying sort of right came about was this idea of candidate representatives uh, at the moment when the ballots were counted. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss the cross-national differences there are in the book, um, but I'm going to actually focus on sort of right in a way the harder cases, the cases that had sort of right the single dominant parties were actually sort of right, which controlled access to state resources and were sort of right, were, were the kind of, you know, um, it, the coming together with uh, putting up a kind of a political coalition was, was much harder. Um, so let me just pre uh, preview here. Um, was this not moving? Yes. Yes. When do these cases of yours get secret ballot? So it, it depends because kind of. I will show you that there is a. <laughs> yes. That, so there is a difference between nominal and real protection of ballot secrecy that will be kind of salient here. So, sort of, so in the cases kind of, you know, there is sort of a nominal protection. So there is a secret ballot in the electoral law, but that is not de facto implemented because of these irregularities in the size of the container and so on. So the real reforms that I'm focusing about sort of right come about much later. So 18, say 1870, secret ballot, right? And then sort of right around 1910, 1905, between 1905 and 1910, actually the real protection of ballot secrecy. Okay, so sort of right, so, and this is an important gap because I'm gonna show you that sort of right, the vote was observed, all right? Okay, so just to put some context about the French context that I'm gonna be using kind of in this course, just and sort of right, so since this is, um, you know, um, maybe a case that we don't cover so often in comparison. So what is the partisan kind of landscape in, in sort of right, Third Republic France? So we have this dominant party, the Republicans, okay, sort of right, who come to power, sort of right after 1870, okay, and since they control the state of re resources, since they control the policemen and the prefects and so on, right, they're not sort of, there's no turnover, they stay in power. On the right, they face the monarchists, right, who wanted the return, okay, to monarchy, right, and on the left, they faced kind of, you know, socialists, okay, and then sort of right, at some point in time, the Republicans split in two wings, between sort of right, the centrist Republican and the sort of right, the more, the, the radicals, which are more pro programmatic kind of, you know, sort of right candidates. And sort of this elite split, we will see sort of right, has kind of consequences. But why is this important? Is this kind of, this partisan distinction is important? It's important for the party competition because the Republicans control the access to state resources and the monarchists, the wealthy candidates, the sort of right, the non-aligned with the state competed on the basis of, of private money, right? So they had access to vote buying and the Republicans had access to sort of state resources and that sets in motion the kind of, you know, the different kind of coalitions. So each, each kind of party had an incentive in kind of, you know, limiting the irregularity of the other party but not limiting their own. Okay, and that's sort of right, what's an important case and I show sort of right how in the German cases. Uh, okay, so sort of right, so how do sort of right, so now I step to the individual politician and I'm trying to think through their logic on sort of right, how is it that they think about this problem of corruption reform? Sort of right, what are the factors that enter their utilities? And I argue that there's three things, I mean sort of highly simplified. First is, do you have the resource, right? Can you come, if it is about vote buying, can you compete? Do you have the money? 
right, that you, that you can use in elections to sort of, right, I mean, kind of, you know, to campaign. Do you have access to the policeman? Do you have access to the state? If you have access, right, you are resource in doubt and sort of, right, and you don't want the reform, kind of, right, the status quo disadvantages you. So the, the hard thing is figuring out when and under what conditions kind of this coalition, so the initial coalitions that the form, the initial cleavage is simply based on kind of resources, right? Do you have it or you don't? The hard thing in understanding is under what conditions does this initial kind of coalition break down, right? Under what conditions do some politicians that have access to resources in fact defect and support, uh, and support the reform? And there's two factors that enter sort of right their calculation and enter sort of right, I mean, kind of, you know, sort of may motivate, may peel away in a way sort of the way I think about it, may sort of disintegrate this initial coalition of the resource advantaged one. And sort of and uh, and make them support reform. One is again building on the market. Well, it has to do with the economic cost, right? At some point, sort of right, there are these changes in the district that make it much costlier for you to use that resources, right? And this builds on kind of you know um, Stokes and Dunning and so on, right? Who say sort of right development um, and so on, right? Kind of you know make increase the, the cost of vote buying. But I'm extending this because kind of in the cases that I'm showing is sort of right. It is. It's other resources, and this is especially economic development affects a particular strategy very strongly, which is the using of employers as brokers, right? Kind of if, if this becomes, you know, increasingly kind of costly, we can see sort of, right, a reconsideration of, of, the, um, of the attractiveness of this strategy. And the second sort of, right, um, part of the calculation, again, sort of, right, we're trying to understand here under what conditions does the status quo become too costly, has to do with something that, uh, you know, Herbert Kitchell, has called, you know, sort of right, I know, uh, um, very loosely, you know, electoral costs. So how should we think about sort of electoral costs? Well, at some point, kind of, you know, using one illicit strategy, using some form of corruption may become too costly for a candidate. Why? Because of two reasons. One, first, voters may find it, this is Rebecca's work, in fact, <laughs> voters may sanction at some point in time, and particularly if you're a candidate that competes on the basis of programmatic promises and you are what Herbert Kitchell calls sort of, can be perceived as a schizophrenic candidate, you go out there and promise policy and then sort of write, and then you kind of offer bribes, that candidate is more likely to incur a particular cost. So there's sort of right the voter reaction. But the second sort of right and more important uh, sort of right consideration has to do with sort of right the responses to other of other candidates to malfeasance. So again, in the kind of many kind of of the countries that we're including in this kind of study, these countries had an electoral system based on runoffs, right? So candidates kind of competed in the first round, made a lot of parties entered, and then sort of right the two leading kind of candidates kind of competed in runoffs. So you as a candidate have to anticipate whether your kind of likely sort of right kind of you know competitor in the first round is likely to support you in a runoff. And here it is sort of right, and kind of using the policeman against the other candidates sort of might be more costly because kind of you are going to scare off, kind of, you know, the, you are going to re, uh, decrease your potential kind of coalition uh, alliances in runoffs. So as long as sort of, as party fragmentation and as sort of this elite split, which is a variable that I'm stressing in this book kind of increases, and the likelihood to rely on kind of runoffs increases, kind of, you know, sort of the cost, the sort of the electoral cost of these illicit strategies kind of increases. So this is sort of right a stylized presentation of the choice theoretic kind of, you know, uh, choices. So, so, right, so it's these three variables that I will be sort of right then kind of taking to the data is, do you have the resource? Yes or no? If you have a resor relative resource advantage, you will not want a reform. Do you face economic costs? Uh, yes or no? And sort of right as your economic uh, kind of, you know, costs increase, then sort of we're gonna see sort of right a group kind of, you know, breaking away in a way from this kind of majority that supports the status quo and sort of supporting reform. And finally, kind of do you potentially sort of face these electoral costs? And so the argument here is that sort of right, the important, the pivotal legislators, the one that switch in this process from having the resources and liking the status quo to sort of right, supporting um, um, a reform are those that are resource in doubt, but who may face high economic or electoral costs, right? And this is the example of the national liberals in Germany, or this is the example of kind of the radicals in France. They can use the state, they can use the policemen, but it becomes at some point so costly that they would rather sort of right support the reform. So that's the sort of right stylized uh, sort of right view that connects kind of these elite, elite splits to sort of demand for reform working through these two different mechanisms, either fragmentation or kind of programmatic uh, differentiation that both increase the electoral uh, cost. And just to give you an example, sort of right, what I'm talking about here, 
the situation in Germany and of the sort of right of the national liberal kind of right. So we had these two kind of parties on the right that controlled elections, they controlled the brokers, they controlled policemen. We see this elite split. We see sort of right a, 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 an increase in the sort of right the share of national liberals that now has to uh, compete and has to uh, compete and relies on runoffs. And it is these kind of legislators that switch over time, and it is these kind of legislators that sort of alley with the resource constraint, with the socialists, okay, with the kind of you know Catholics, with the centrum in supporting reform. I'm going to show you this sort of more extensively in the in the cases, but that's but that's that, that's that's the broader logic, okay. So why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because it gives us a very simple logic that can explain why the majority supporting reforms is not the same um, in all issue areas, but why it differs across issue areas depending on kind of on the resources. So again, to, to use this kind of example with which I started, the monarchies, the sort of right, the kind of, you know, the candidates sort of with the money, with the right resources, they, they wanted to limit the ability of the Republicans to use the state resources, but they wanted no constraint on their use of using private resources. The Republicans, okay, wanted to limit vote buying, but they had no incentive in limiting the use of state resources. So you see sort of right, two parties on the right with kind of, you know, sort of right, with sort of right, uh, with very, very different incentives to support reform on different issue areas. So this sort of simple framework gives us a framework that to explain something that the existing democratization theory doesn't allow. Because in the existing framework, right, the conservatives always oppose reform because they anticipated higher taxation and so on and so forth. No, so <laughs> the majorities differ. Okay, we can think of sort of right, we can explain why, okay, the monarchies actually want to limit the ability of the, right, of the Republicans to use the state resource. And they're an important part of the majority. I'm gonna come back to this. But I'm just trying to say we have to sort of have a framework that gives us an ability to account for shifting coalitions across policy areas depending on the sort of resource type. And I think that is, a, that is a, an improvement over, over the existing framework. So now I'll go to the cases which are more fun. And actually you're gonna see how, how I work uh, through this. Okay, so reform dimension one. What are we talking about here? We're talking about bribing and, um, and, um, and vote buying. Okay, so part of the data in the book is looking at the uh, detailed um, corruption ref reports that we have. So, so, right, so in, in many of these countries, right, and kind of, you know, f to be validated as a candidate, sort of, right, and kind of there was an initial kind of, you know, sort of investigation and sort of, right, and seeing what, whether there was an irregularity present. So this pulls up all the sort of, right, the re reports and all sort of French elections between, 19, between 1817 and 1914, um, and it shows us quite interesting that vote buying is not the dominant irregularity, right? What was wrong in French elections was the use of the state resources. Kind of, this was a more sort of right residual, in a way, story, but it was present. Um, and who was sort of right? I mean, and who were the kind of the parties um, um, engaged in vote buying? Well, clearly, these were not the candidates that could use the state resources, right? There was no sort of right. I mean, they already had their brokers, right, these were the kind of, you know, the, the monarchists, okay, so sort of who didn't access, who didn't have access to state resources, but who had access to private funds. So if we look sort of right, there's, you know, it's, it's a little bit like contemporary elections in the sense that sort of there is a lot and, you know, small amounts of money, okay, treating, right, non-targeted, okay, sort of and a, a wide variety of goods. And so here is sort of right one example, right, the arch millionaire, okay, sort of right, a, a, a kind of a monarchist kind of, you know, candidates, Okay, sort of right, I mean, who um, sort of right, who was kind of, you know, um, investigated election after election. So this asymmetry, right, in the resources sets in motion this initial cleavage line. Okay, so right, with Republicans wanting to limit this and monarchists, okay, which, because this was their dominant strategy opposing it. So I'm looking at the roll call votes over these sort of right reforms and trying to sort of right put these three sort of variables that I pr proposed in sort of right in a simple kind of regression framework. The resource advantage, in this case, the wealth, okay, sort of, right, <laughs> sort of the wealth or the occupation. I mean, kind of in the British case, you're gonna see I have actually the actual wealth, okay, because I went, I went to the archives and sort of right and get that kind of there. The wealth here, sort of, we're gonna proxy it with occupation. The partisan resource advantage, again, kind of the monarch is not wanting it, and everyone is wanting it. Possible economic costs, the size of the electorate, making it kind of, you know, costlier urbanization population, and the electoral cost, and that's, you know, the hardest one sort of right to measure. So again, as I said, sort of right, if you are competing on the basis of programmatic promises, you are more likely to find sort of offering also bribes more costly. So how do I measure this? 
The beauty about France, and I was talking to some students that we should all be studying France because it has amazing data. It's kind of we actually have the platforms of every single candidate sort of for this period. So I'm coding these. I mean, this is like an incredible <laughs> resource. Right, so I'm kind of the profession de foi. This is what the French parliament has collected. So, write every kind of campaign manifesto, okay, going back to the 1870. And I'm going to sort of write just proxy it with one variable. So, right, is the candidate kind of talking about progressive taxation, which was the main electoral issue at the time? And this is how they look like. And here you see sort of at the candidate, Jean Paul Malvi, and he talks about the progressive tax, which will replace the direct contribution. So, I'm coding this kind of candidate as programmatic, okay? And I have an other sets of papers where we explain the sort of right, the, why this happens. and where we have, uh, an but this is sort of right, I mean, this is the measure. So I have sort of right systematic measure of programmaticness kind of, you know, for all candidates. And so in the case of uh, vote buying, how, does, how do the coalitions look like? Well, it's quite interesting and sort of right in a way kind of, you know, consistent with what I told you, right? The monarchist right doesn't want the reform. All the other resource um, constraint uh, uh, candidates who don't have access to the right to personal wealth support it, the socialists, the radicals. We have a significant effect of the sort of right, the individual level, the, whether you're an owner or not, sort of right, you're, you're opposed to these reforms. And then electoral sort of right, the programmaticness also sort of right, the significant. So the more sort of right you compete on the basis of programmatic promises, you are supportive of these reforms. And then sort of right, we see very little impact of the economic variable. So I'm testing for <laughs> everything that is there, sort of everything that you can think of, of economic development at the constituency level, and they sort of right, they explain very little once we take this into account. But this becomes interesting only if we look at the other cases. So here the resource asymmetry, yes, support for this, economic costs, weak, weakly support, and electoral costs is salient in the case of this reform. The most important problem in French elections was the use of sort of right, the state resources was this what is known as the la candidature officielle, the use of um, of um, you know sort of right uh, official symbols and and resources of state power having sort of right being kind of politicized by candidates and particularly kind of by uh, by Republicans and this is sort of right the relative use of this strategy as a share of the total sort of forms of corruption in each elections over time, kind of, you know, it decreases over time, but it is in some elections as high as 80%. So 80% of the contested elections in France involve some kind of allegations of, of the use of state resources. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the prefects. So everyone sort of down the sort of line of this French state, from the prefect, deputy prefect, mayor, employee, local employees, kind of, you know, the sort of right, the tax collectors, the um, okay, the sort of right, the, even the teachers, okay, sort of right, being kind of politicized at elections on behalf of each kind of candidates, okay? And sort of and the use of different sort of right policies, again, similar to the work of Rebecca in Argentina, <laughs> okay, sort of right, the use of the same sort of right state policies to incentivize voters. The point of this is that sort of in this kind of on this policy issue, the resource advantage flips, right? It is the Republicans that have this advantage and it is the monarchists that don't have it. So as a result, we should expect a different kind of coalition. This, this was a reform that was kind of heavily opposed by the kind of the party that controls state resources and, uh, and strongly supported uh, by, by kind of the, the sort of the opponents. I'm not gonna spend time on this. This is sort of right the type of bills that we're looking at, but this is sort of right how the kind of the Coalitional landscape looks like in the case of these, uh, of these reforms. And what do we see here? We see here that the right, of course, the monarchists are now the actors pushing for it. They want to limit the ability of the Republicans to use the state resources. And it is kind of you no know, Republicans that are, you know, here that's not significant and they are sort of right opposed or split over these reforms. We don't see any evidence of, you know, individual level, you know, sort of right factors that may sort of be affiliate, that may predict the use of these resources. And we see sort of right also not, not much in terms of the kind of the programmatic policy. But this, this just illustrates that it is really specific to the, the particular kind of, you know, resource that is at stake. That here in this case, kind of, you know, we see the sort of right, the right, okay, the monarchist right, being kind of this actor that really wants to use, to limit the use of state resources. I'm turning now to this, this the use of sort of, and I'm answering kind of your question on sort of right ballot secrecy. This was the hardest reform, okay? This, this, they started in 1870, they only ended in 1915. Every kind of, you know, uh, electoral kind of, you know, period, they, they sort of right, tried to think about what to do. So as I mentioned before in your, in your question, there's this gap between nominal and real protection of voting secrecy, right? Sort of right, technically they had the secret ballot. In practice, this was not the case. Why? Okay, um, 
One, we had ballots of different kinds. Okay, sort of right that were marked by uh, exterior signs that distinguished it from others. So in the German case, and I know some of you have read that that work, um, right? Sort of right. We had um, you know the use of different paper. Also, it's important that the candidates were distributing the ballots. Right? It was not sort of a centrally kind of you know sort of made, but each kind of candidate was in charge of providing their own ballot, and as a result, they could kind of you know sort of right. Uh, um, you know, sort of right, I mean, um, vary the size and the shape so, so that you could kind of then observe. It was important, the stacking of ballots was also important, right? The sort of right, the irregularity of the containers. The use, and here comes from sort of an election report, cigar boxes, drawers, suitcases, uh, sort of cooking pots, beer mugs, and so on. Why does this matter? Well, it was, it's important because the ballots were stacked on each other. Okay, in the order in which was dropped, and once the container was open, it was really easy to sort of write to figure out who voted how. Okay, so the issue of the sort of the reform of the sort of you know as of the sort of urn, okay, voting on sort of occupied them for you know 50 years, and of course, kind of you know there was very little incentives to change it. And here is sort of right from the German you know Bundesarchiv, sort of right once kind of you know German employers understood that this was a lucrative business that actually sort of right there would be a future demand for these uh, you know urns that would kind of, you know, sort of, right, undo the stacking of ballots, they came up with different proposals. These are some proposals that the government received on how to sort of, right, modify voting technology and how to sort of, right, solve this problem of sort of, right, the imperfect protection. Okay, so this was a sort of, right, a very, very long uh, and thought out uh, question. And importantly, sort of, right, kind of candidates in this kind of particular irregularity, as I'm showing, and uh, you've, you've read some other things I've written, so, right, this is the case where they were really using employers. Why? Employers were sort of, right, present at the voting place. They could observe the ballots, and they had the means to impose the hardest punishments on the voters because they could lay them off. And so we have this practice of economic layoffs very well, sort of, right, documented at the time. And sort of, in a way, one of the resource advantages is whether or not you had an access to an employer. Okay, um, so again, here on this kind of, you know, sort of right uh, reform dimension, I expect kind of, you know, these economic kind of variables to be highly salient because kind of they affect kind of the calculations of employers. So the resistance was, uh, sorry, so the resistance, okay, to, as I said, to the sort of right to uh, the protection of ballot secrecy was very, very high. Uh, they came up with various kind of, you know, arguments why they stalled this reform. It's very costly for locality. You know, we can't do it. This is going to slow down the voting process if we introduce this kind of this envelope that's just, okay, no one is going to vote and so on and so forth. So, so, right, so the opposition is the same in all kind of countries. And here I'm showing you also the kind of the results on Germany because kind of this was, as I started with this example, this was the dominant problem in Germany elections. It was not vote buying. And here we see again that sort of if we look at who supported and who opposed kind of, you know, these simple measures to have a ballot envelope, to have an isolating space, to have this urn that is kind of, you know, undoing the stacking, we see sort of right this interesting cleavage line. That sort of right on the one hand, the conservatives, right, who had access to the employers, they were clearly opposed. But on the other hand, sort of right, um, In the fact, in the kind of in the final bill that was adopted, it was with sort of right with national level support against kind of the conservatives. Okay, so electoral costs, uh, okay, sort of are salient here. And again, sort of surprisingly, I find very little sort of right evidence of the kind of the standard economic variables that sort of right the economic kind of modernization theory uh, predicts. I can come back to this. Um, in the French case, it's quite interesting. Again, the right, right, the monarchists, okay, in opposition. And the sort of right, the socialists and radicals, right, sort of right, and kind of in a way pushing for these reforms. And again, sort of right, this individual level attribute, whether or not you're an owner, whether or not you have access to these kind of economic brokers, being, you know, a highly significant predictor of, of the support for the reforms. Um, okay. Um, so. Uh, so on this uh, reform dimension, again, sort of right, partisan uh, asymmetries, okay, sort of right, um, about weak relationship between the economic variables and, and the demand for the reforms. So finally, and I'll kind of wrap up, but just sort of right, this is an interesting case. Uh, why? Because it creates an unusual coalition. So the final issue was this sort of the issue of fraud and how to limit it, how to limit the ability of the mayors. Okay, to sort of right to just modify the ballots that were cast with a sort of a different kind of you know set of ballots and sort of right mo modifying the vote. This was uh, highly salient in France, 
And the solution that sort of Belgium invented and then sort of right, it's spreading through all these kind of countries is this idea of allowing kind of partisan representatives at the time the ballots were counted. You see that in France, kind of the proposals sort of right, start in the 1890s and it takes a long, long time until 1905 to support uh, uh, for, these, uh, uh, for these reforms. Um, so um, maybe going to skip this, this is becomes, I mean, sort of right, this requires a different measure of resource advantage. I mean, maybe sort of, right, I mean, kind of I right, spend too much time in, in the kind of questions. It's quite interesting here uh, to see that sort of, right, I mean, this creates what I call in the book a coalition of extremes against the center. Why? Neither the, the monarchists nor the socialists had access to the mayors. Right? So they, in a way, these are parties that have nothing kind of in common. Again, sort of, right, it's just the, the only thing they have in common is that they cannot control the mayor. So these are, sort of, right, the parties that support these reforms. Again, sort of, a, a kind of an unexpected kind of coalition, if you think about it, in favor of democratization, against kind of, you know, the, the Republicans who clearly, you know, sort of, right, had the resource advantage, and the radicals who now, now shift because of their kind of increasing kind of, you know, electoral cost and support reform. So I call this kind of extreme against the center. And why this is interesting, it is interesting, again, because it shows us that to understand coalitions for democratization, one needs to go be beyond the sort of simple thing that, well, it is the wealthy or it is the sort of right, uh, the wealthy that oppose reforms or it is kind of these monarchies that are always sort of right anti-democratic. And here in this case, we see that sort of right, because the sort of right, the monarchists had this sort of incentives, they were sort of right pivotal in this kind of majority ending kind of, you know, fraud. Okay. So I think kind of it's just, we can leave the sort of explanation with these three simple sort of right variables that I have highlighted. The resources are really salient because they show us whether you're in support or opposition, the economic and the electoral costs. And just to conclude, um, I think kind of what we're learning from this case is that it's sort of right that the composition of the coalitions really differs. There's not one single kind of, you know, sort of right path to democratization. There's not one single kind of, you no know, force that brings about these electoral reforms to understand how Europe democratized. We need to unpack, we need to disaggregate corruption, and we need to look at kind of, you know, reform dimension by reform dimension. And we need to sort of, right, to be able to account for this heterogeneity, right? That the sort of right democratization came about through different coalitions, some of which brought together very unusual kind of, you know, uh, parties, the, the monarchists and the socialists kind of, you know, wanting the same thing and wanting to limit the ability of the Republicans, uh, okay, to limit, uh, to, uh, to engage in fraud. Economic theories of democratization, I'm not sure, sort of, again, I told you that you know, on theoretical grounds, I simply don't see this kind of this causal chain. I do think kind of this is a weakness of these theories that sort of write that kind of we cannot derive the incentives from expectations about redistribution, but we need to think of something more immediate, more direct. Maybe that works too. <laughs> I remain to be convinced, but sort of right, I'm just trying to propose something more uh, direct. And if sort of right, if you still believe in these theories, I still think I mean that these theories have a problem because they cannot account for this composition. They cannot account why the monarchists are on in support of democratizing reform in the case of sort of right fraud and opposed to it when it comes kind of to vote buying. So sort of I think kind of we need something more flexible that allows us for these kind of you know rich kind of parties with resources to be on different sides of the issues depending on the sort of right on the reform dimension. And I think kind of this is what this kind of case teaches us. That sort of there's multiple sort of coalitions and it's not one single process and sort of you can be both in favor or in opposition. And so we have to think of sort of right the resources more, more systematically. So that's what I learned from these cases. So thanks Great. a lot. Thank you. Would you like to see yeah, I, I, maybe, yes, uh, please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Great. So some questions. I'm wondering if you can tell us something about the timing of these reforms. Uh, you know, wh why did they happen at this particular time? Well, so, it, it, so there's not, I don't have a sort of a theory of timing. I mean, kind of, you know, sort of in the end, you needed a majority, right? And so, sort of, so what are the sort of moving variables in the story? It is this programmatic differentiation, right? It is the election with the runoff. So this idea, it's it actually sort of, right, and kind of works differently in different kind of cases. So, right, so those that sort of shift, right, the pivotal ones, so in France, again, sort of, right, I, mean, I have other papers where we're showing sort of where does programmatic politics come from, and it has to do with the Philoxera shock, which sort of, right, this is a really big shock that is kind of affecting the French economy, and then sort of, at, after that, proposals for sort of, right, spending the distribution increases. So we see sort of, right, this change in the type of politicians that are getting elected, and sort of, right, this rise of the radicals, which I don't talk too much here, 
Okay, it's one, but I'm just trying to stay away from, you know, the theories that sort of think of the main actor as being on the left. Okay, the left was present, but it's not sort of right, it's not pivotal in any ways. I mean, you're not gonna explain this by saying it is social democracy that democratized capitalism. The fact that I showed you in the German case, there were even more problems. But so right, it is not a socialist, there were like maybe 10, that, I mean, the socialists emerged after, I mean, that's so interesting, right? The sort of why is social democracy emerging in Germany is after we protect the belt. That's when they, so it's <laughs> okay, endogenous. The left is endogenous. So I'm not saying that the pivotal ones, right, if you think about sort of right, this period, is sort of, yes, they are sort of there, they're present, but it's sort of, to get to 50%, okay, you need kind of these, these kind of legislators on the right who, for some reason, change their mind, okay, think that the status quo is too costly, and then they switch. Okay, so, so yes, there is something about the social democratization, but it's just not the only kind of thing that is uh, happening. So, and I don't know how this works in, in this case, although you have sort of similar yes. um, So I think we need something that is that puts more action on the right and kind of tries to understand sort of right the cleavages uh, in, in the power. Yeah. Sure. So I, I guess similarly, like I understand how there's this relationship where one side has you know incentive to want certain types of reforms but not other type of reforms and there seems to be kind of a cross, like they don't want the other mm -hmm. side to <coughs> have reforms, that are, like have do what they're doing to manipulate elections. But is there ever exchange between the parties where they're saying like, okay, mm -hmm. we'll limit this, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. limit this. Mm -hmm. Is there that exchange, does that exchange happen and does that change where like the general electorate is? So again, this differs across country and kind of, you know, in the German case, because kind of the only thing that um, is sort of on the agenda is this voter, voter secrecy, right? So there's no kind of issue linkage. Okay, in the French case, because kind of this bill is adopted at the end, it's on the eve of World War One, right? It takes them 50 years, right? They kind of, it gets rejected over time. And then there is sort of, right, this issue linkage, right? Where sort of everything comes in this bill. The use of state resources, they, okay. So, right, so there are some, right, this differs across kind of, you know, cases and sort of, right, in the end, of course, this gives you the opportunity to sort of, right, to, to form a larger coalition, but, but in the end, sort of, right, I mean, you need to go back to the kind of, to the initial sort of, right, to understand sort of, right, this issue specific by issue. Yes, so there's issue linkages in France, not in Britain, not in Germany, okay, so not in Belgium, okay, but in this case, because it's so complicated and because kind of, you know, sort of, right, in the end, it is the Senate that proposes this and then it comes back to the House. So yes, you limit both vote buying and the use of state resources, which is sort of right what kind of in a way both camps kind of you know sort of right it, it creates a kind of a common ground for the both camps. Okay, so that's a very good point. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you <coughs> for the talk. Um, I found a question on the the first part of the argument mm -hmm. that starts with the splits or internal divisions of the elites. Yeah. I was wondering if that's uh, an assumption of the argument or if that's something causing that initial divisions in the first place, and what should we expect in cases where the elite is more cohesive and more even rationalized in terms of the yeah, I agree. That's, so this, in this case, kind of, I mean, why is there elite split? So sort of saying the German case, which is sort of the simplest case, they split over trade, right? The conservative, the national, the sort of split, and they vote sort of right in different ways, and then they don't coordinate anymore, kind of, you know, in sort of right, in, in the kind of, in, in the runoffs, that the right is split, I'm sorry, the, the uh, liberal right is split in many, many sort of right groups, and so sort of right this allows them at, at some point sort of for the liberals to kind of to compete against the kind of conservatives. So this is not something that I theorize about. If you think of Ansel and Samuels, there's also some exogenous elite split that we have to use <laughs> the sort of right to increase, to sort of right to, to help our theory kind of, you know, get to this kind of parameter that we need to, um, to explain. I mean, kind of, I can use a shock, you know, a trade shock or whatever, if you want to think about it systematically, but but it's kind of, you know, I'm just taking that as given. Um, and so just observing sort of right, what, what, are the, uh, what are the implications. And the reasons for the elite split are very, very different again across the cases. So that's difficult to have, you know, sort of a general kind of, you know, comparative theory that has both the elite split and the, <laughs> the sort of, I would be here for three hours explaining. So I'm just taking that as exogenous kind of, you know, we had the trade shock, okay, the kind of Republicans and uh, the conservatives and national liberals are now on different um, sort of that side of the issue. They no longer vote together. Kind of I'm taking that as the starting point, but maybe that's a, a limitation. 
So, but without any split, you would not get there. That's sort of right one of the points that I'm trying to make. Okay, so right. So in other cases, kind of, you know, why did we get to this in only 1914 and not 1870? So well, you need that it's split. Okay, so right, but okay. <laughs> Uh, so good luck with, <laughs> okay, also endogenizing uh, elite split, uh, okay, kind of, you know, I mean, I think it's really important, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, Isabella, thanks so much for the very interesting talk. I thought, um, I think I have a question that's sort of building on some of the earlier questions. It seems to me that reform dimension one, mm -hmm. which is about bribing and treating a voter, is inherently linked to reform dimension three, which is the protection of ballot secrecy. Mm -hmm. So you might think if you adopt the, conventional notion of uh, clientelism that basically says, we will reward you with something if you vote for us, right? The protection of ballot secret, once that goes away, that might undermine the efficacy of the uh, voter bribery strategy and vice versa. So if you don't have, yeah. right, um, yeah. if, if uh, bribery is barred, then mm -hmm. there really isn't really that much of an incentive to uh, protect the ballot. Uh, so like, I feel like there's a linkage, and I wonder if there's any um, uh, sort of observations in your data that suggest that one, the passage of one reform actually affected the other reform as well. Yeah, I have a very long answer, so, so bear with me. I mean, so as you know, uh, I am writing against kind of this view in the literature that, you know, vote buying is so important. Mm -hmm. And in the cases that I study, it so happens that sort of it is a reason. We are overstating mm -hmm. the importance of vote buying. Vote buying is salient mm -hmm. in Britain. Okay, but it is not important at all. So it is a residual strategy in continental Europe, and I'm showing that in the book it has to do. So right, that the, the sort of this bifurcation goes back in time much earlier. It's the Napoleonic code that penalizes vote buying. Okay, so right, and if you offer a bribe, you go to jail. Okay, so this creates very different incentives not to do it. Okay, on the continent that we don't have in Britain. Okay, so as a result, kind of you know, so right, I think of and so right. Read now all these reports. I think I'm over. This is overstated. Mm -hmm. So there is. I see very little vote buying in Germany. Almost absent. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is all historians agree. Some vote buying in France, having to do with a monarchy, is called Arden. This is the only thing they can do, and they have the money. Okay, so sort of the connection that you see when you study for a developing country, I don't see it so much in kind of the cases that are critical. Why? Because the observability happened through the employers, right? Kind of, you know, they are, their main broker is not the vote buying broker. The main broker is the economic broker, and they could observe and they could sanction much harder, right? They could lay off. Okay, so, so, so I don't see this. I mean, and this is why I think it is really important to go back to these cases and actually to rethink what we think about kind of contemporary elections. I do feel, and maybe kind of, you know, Rebecca has something to say or others, so we really are looking at the wrong thing. Okay, kind of, you know, and I show this sort of in Eastern Europe that, you know, vote bank is really ineffective. It's kind of, you know, they, voters renege all the time. They get the gift and then they don't vote. But the economic sanctions, that's the ones that sort of really sort of right are kind of are salient. So I'm trying to bring this dialogue in <laughs> contemporary and historical cases, but I really think uh, it's not salient here because we have this prior sanction. And they don't, they, I mean, unless you are, I mean, if you can do it with a policeman and if you can do it with an employer, you have no reason. Why spend your money if you know you can <laughs> right, you have the broker already there? So it is not it is not a salient uh, irregularity. And I'm you know, I mean, with the exception of Britain, which I still don't understand fully, even after having finished the book, it's sort of like why? <laughs> right, why? Let's go back to the graduate school. No, 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 like really, and I mean this is a kind of you know, these are cases that kind of you know, one, one can do things and I have to think about Britain, but kind of it is really the exceptional case. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I'm very sympathetic to the argument that uh, the economic theories of democratization are basically reading politics of economics mm -hmm. or inequalities, and there is no attention being paid to actual political conflicts or coalition making that goes on, right? So uh, politics is completely endogenous there. Yes. And they don't even examine what kind of what kind of coalitions, what kinds of parties, etc. And I'm very sympathetic to that. I've written that about India yes. recently. Yes. Uh, and But then there is a... An, an argument which has gone in that direction uh, within Europe, which all of us have read, which is Ziblatt's claim. And Ziblatt also uh, fundamentally agrees with this idea that you cannot read it off economics, right? Mm -hmm. Or inequalities. So the, the claim there is that the most uh, central uh, driver is whether or not you can buy off, not buy off, you can offer something 
to allay the anxieties of conservative parties. Because if, with democratization, they will lose. And if you cannot uh, bring them on onto your, on, onto your side, then they have the power, the social power, to block democratization. Right? So it's basically what's driving there is, is whether or not, how you deal with the, uh, conservative parties. Huh? You are saying that that's not enough. We, we have wide heterogeneity. Yes. It's heterogeneity that is driving your politics, not just the conservative party. Yes, thank you for that. Right? I have yeah. lots of this. I have written against. Uh, against the Blatt's claim. Yes. Okay. But, 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 but may I say that uh, that literature is about democratization. It seems to me your DV is not democratization. Your DV is cleaning up the electoral process. Yeah, your, your DV is cleaning up, getting rid of corruption rather than democratization per se, unless you say uh, cleaning up the, the electoral process or the political process is a, a part of your definition of democratization, right? So, so I think the DV is very different there because they don't get into vote buying and... Yeah? So I just want you to, want you to react to what I'm saying. So first of all, I mean, we have, um, so there's many, many points in, in the argument. So first of all, I'm kind of, you know, I mean, he's showing the backlash only in the Weimar period. He has, when he has the paper, the world politics paper that looks at sort of the secret ballot in Russia, that is democracy. This is the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. I think, I mean, he's overstating kind of, you know, that sort of the, so, okay, so, so right, kind of, we are on the same page that we recognize kind of, you know, sort of right, that most important form of illicit influence is economic kind of. He only thinks this is only rural, I think, and I think I show, that it is also both urban and poor. All right, so, so, right, so why assume, okay, so if you think kind of, con why conservatives only, the liberals could do this too, they had their employers, they sort of right, the employers were the main agent of intimidation, okay, so they had the same incentive, so there's no reason a priori to put sort of right, all the action on the conservative side. Well, so, and that's an important point, okay, uh, right, okay. On the sort of right, and kind of the dependent variable, kind of, I, I, Okay, now it's sort of right. He again talks about the same reforms, and I do think this is in the end democratization because in the end it has to do with sort of right the composition of the electoral and sort of the, and whose vote kind of who can vote freely, right? Which is a sort of right a, typical, a crucial kind of question. In a sense, and what okay. is sort of right at stake here is whether we kind of control the voters so much that they're going to vote conservative because we observe their vote and then we lay them off which is sort of, right, this is where the stories overlap. And this is where, yes, we find this, the resistance, but I do think he cannot explain the shift. He cannot explain why Germany had sort of, right, this secret, but it's not the conservatives, they never move, but still Germany introduces kind of, you know, sort of, right, ballot secrecy, which is a major reform. Let me point out, after ballot secrecy, the Social Democratic Party becomes the largest party, that the vote share triples, yes, all these repressed voters are now voting left, so it's super important kind of, you know, sort of right issue. And the kind of, you know, and the explanation for the reform is not sort of just simply kind of conservatives against, you know, Catholics, but it's sort of the pivotal player, as I show here, is kind of the national liberals. So I think we have things in common, but I think I disagree on the sort of right on the politics. And I also, so that sort of would be a, and I also disagree. I have these whole things on what rural inequality explains. I have a bunch of papers, and I have, I'm happy to discuss all things. I don't and think it explains, <laughs> it explains much, so please kind of, you know, I'm happy to share this with you. I, I just disagree on sort of how much weight, and this matters because it matters theoretically. What does rural inequality in fact explain in this story? That's to me a sort of a super important theoretical question. And I, sh you know, so that's sort of, we can have this separate debate on the, the relationship between rural inequality and conservatives, and then sort of write the demand for reform. And that's sort of the backlash which is kind of it seems you're also saying a neat single factor or dual factor theory of democratization is not going to be possible. If you have, if you pay attention to specific histories, that's when you understand politics better rather than, yeah. rather than through some kind of generalization across countries without paying attention to what kind of political conflicts are emerging. Yes, I agree with you. So we are on the same page. Yes. Right? <laughs> I'm going to pause it there. Uh, Rebecca. Yeah, thanks, Isabella. This was fantastic. I, I really appreciate the sort of unpacking of just this macro phenomenon to specific reforms. Um, but I am going to sort of build on the tension that Ashu identified and try and link it to contemporary democracies, which I appreciate, you know, is, is very important to think about. And so, I mean, thinking, so I have a specific, 
specific question, do you ever see backsliding of any of these mm. reforms in these cases? So they adopt the secret mm. ballot, but then some new technology mm. emerges to mm -hmm. allow them yeah. to continue to detect it. Or yeah. this type of substitution yes. that yes. you talk about in the Romanian yes. case, right? So you disallow bribery, but now you use social policy. Can I answer this first and then? Sure. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. this is really, so this is the limiting kind of um, cases. Why sort of these cases tell us something or not. Everything changes after World War One because these countries move to PR, and everything changes because we have large districts. So Germany moves from 400 to 30 districts. Kind of the whole technology of campaigning changes. We're not campaigning in these little kind of districts where we observe every voter. Now we have to bring in the sort of violence. So there is substitution. Yeah. So kind of I think I have a doctoral student. I'm trying to push him to write the story of sort of right, how violence entered the German elections because it doesn't enter here. It enters later, right? Because kind of the change in the district. But PR kind of you know changes everything. Kind of you don't have these wealthy candidates kind of you know campaigning now you have parties you know sort of choosing kind of who runs and so on and so forth so there's only that much we can learn from these kind of cases because we have this sort of PR reform sort of introduced everywhere after World War One that makes these cases less relevant for contemporary democracies so that's my short yeah so, so on that point so like I'm thinking about the contemporary Guatemalan elections yes. which will yeah. see you know what will happen but so thinking about what do, what does what do we mean by changing technology? So most contemporary democracies or mm -hmm. semi-democracies or partial democracies um, have a secret ballot, and, but what's become increasingly important is the existence of quasi-independent mm -hmm. electoral agencies or judicial bodies. Mm -hmm. So in the Guatemalan case, it seems like what happened in the most recent election is so a party, you know, a, a candidate and party who are pro-democratic against the ruling elite coalition wins. Mm -hmm. It's clear yeah. the votes mm -hmm. are counted, they win. Yeah. But now there's gonna be a lot of, yeah. you know, there's a few months still, yes. still yeah. the, until the winning candidate is supposed to take office, and there's gonna be a lot of attempts by the ruling mm -hmm. elite to use the judicial process or other processes yes. to overturn these yes. reforms. So I guess a question I have for contemporary democracies is technology in, in the broadest yes. sense. Yes. Like, does that make these type of sort of more micro reforms less relevant? Mm -hmm. Or thinking about what I really like about this is you know, bringing in both economic and political actors mm -hmm. at one time. I mean, my, speculating wildly, what might matter for the Guatemalan case is that economic elites for other reasons might be, mm -hmm. might be sort of changing their preferences mm -hmm. and um, that we might now take the view that it behooves them to allow the election results to hold. So there's some, that's sort of a through line with what you're saying is the importance of the incentives of economic elites. Yeah. But like, so I really like this micro yeah. stuff, but are there new technologies such that all of it doesn't matter if, if there's some um, other way to just reverse the entire electoral process? Yeah. yeah, this is very hard. So I just must say, I'm on the economic end. So we've measured this, but get a 20% with a list experiment. How many, you know, my employer told me how to vote. 20%, okay, in Hungary, okay. In Romania, okay, 15%, okay, so this is present. Okay, this has not disappeared. This is sort of not one of kind of these technologies in the past, kind of you see it sort of, right, it's a widespread uh, sort of strategy that I think we have not sort of measured systematically because we focus so much on the vote buying. So I think, okay, I hope kind of we will all sort of start measuring the whole menu and then sort of right and then kind of having a theory of why the mix differs across cases and time and I think right now and that appears is both of them right I mean you have done more because you've opened it up to the state resources but then there's the economic court there's so much else that is on the table and I was talking about Poland and the priests and so on so on, kind of who are the brokers you know sort of in so I think I'm just sort of trying to say the menu is we don't know what the menu is in many kind of countries because we've only measured one strategy. Um, okay, and this, the change in the, that's that's much harder. And so it is present even with kind of, you know, I mean, in Hungary, it's kind of the ballot is secret, but both cities, I mean, like just in the US case, kind of this Alan Berger paper, still, you know, 40% tell you that the ballot is not secret. They be, don't believe in the secret. So the action of the broker is about influencing voters, voters' belief about ballot secrecy. That is where the action is. <laughs> so I think kind of even with a sort of secret ballot, sort of rather than kind of, you know, where is the strategy? It is not about, you know, I mean, kind of, you know, in the end, they, they develop a secret everywhere, kind of, you know, we don't have it, but it is about influencing beliefs, okay? So this, so there are many <laughs> similarities, okay? That sort of, so I don't think kind of this is so, 
remote from what I have seen and, and documented kind of, you know, in sort of EU kind of you know, member states. Okay, so, but the, on the, how the election process is, so that's more complicated. And here in these cases, do they move from the sort of, kind of the parliament to the kind of having kind of a leadership kind of institution, mm -hmm. which is not as politicized, but it's also slowing things down. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, I don't have, I don't know how to comment on that. That's a separate, but on the menu, I think kind of, we can learn here, and I, I find, This is a really such a rich talk, and thank you so much for coming to share your work. And my comments also build on a lot of the questions that you've already gotten. I, mean, I was also almost thinking of the Ziblatt argument, but I think that the way that I was thinking about it was that, and, and I might have my temporality. But you know, the temporality of it, I, I might have wrong, but what I feel is that he is, is really talking about like when suffrage gets instituted in a way, and that is the process of democratization. But I think you're actually looking at something, and I think you realize it, that has far more contemporary importance, which is once suffrage is instituted, as the title of the book says, how do you protect it, right? How do you protect the ballot? And so to me, um, you know, I kind of understood it, and again, I don't know how the temporality is, that it's a sequence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in a way, what, you, what you're drawing attention to is you know the, the kind of many ways in which once suffrage is instituted, it can be challenged. So I almost thought of it as like challenges to democracy. I think you call it corruption, and I think you're absolutely right to point out that the the dominant emphasis has been on vote buying, mm -hmm. and I completely I'm completely sympathetic and appreciate your kind of move to push it beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so the way that I was thinking about it analytically is that you know Ziblatt's in a different category. He's talking about this process of instituting. Mm -hmm. Suffrage. You are in a you are in a category. I think much more in conversation mm -hmm. with people like Rebecca, mm -hmm. and I think people who work on the global mm -hmm. south in terms mm -hmm. of what are the challenges to democracy, mm -hmm. and within that kind of opening it up and saying, um, you know, it's vote buying, but drawing attention to I think this really important um, mm -hmm. aspect, which is the incumbent's use of state resources. Mm -hmm. I think that that's like absolutely critical. And I guess my question to you was, you know, how exactly? Like, is the incumbent's use of state resources as an analytic category, what is the overlap or distinction with, with like, clientelism? And in some ways, um, I'm also just, and, you know, pork barrel politics and patronage broadly mm -hmm. defined, and, you know, we have a lot of that literature on India, mm -hmm. as you well know. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I'm also just curious, then, um, if you think that this, I think, quite important idea that you have about elite splits and alliances, mm -hmm. and, you know, costs versus benefits, mm -hmm. if that also can allow us to change the way that we've thought about these non-vote buying, mm -hmm. other forms of kind of electoral malfeasance, uh, which is not about instituting the suffrage, but about challenges to mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that kind of change the way that we look at those, mm -hmm. uh, or, or and would it kind of change mm -hmm. theories of, of mm -hmm. people who would not use the words corruption, mm -hmm. but really kind of just say we are scholars mm -hmm. of clientelism. Yeah. So I just think, I mean, um, Susan's talk book is very important. Can you speak in the Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I know this goes against your style, yes. I think. But. Okay, so Susan Stokes, so what do I mean by clientelism? I really think the book is really important and showing sort of a limiting, so patronage is not clientelism. So clientelism is a theory where the, well, is a set of actions where the candidate has brokers and then the brokers observe voters' choices, right? And we need this observability to define a strategy as clientelism. If you just do this kind of, you know, pork or whatever, that is not clientelism. And I think kind of this distinction that she made <laughs> Rebecca makes and so on. This is very important because it allows us to serve, right, to actually define what we're talking about. So when I talk about the use of state resources, I really mean this and only in this narrow way is, is the kind of, you know, sort of, I mean, do we see the connection to the voter in the sense that, one, we have to understand the brokers and I think kind of this is where the discussion is in the, and Danny is here, right, and everyone who studies elections in the contemporary world is like, we really need to characterize the menu of brokers, right? I mean, we <laughs> don't have a good, overview of how they are. Policemen, right, I mean kind of, you know, policemen, teachers, right, all these employees of the state are very, very important in this menu. And all I'm trying to sort of write, point to that, that sort of, right, if you look at the vote buying brokers are the brokers that you hire on the spot transaction, you pay them, they deliver, and then you fire them, that's vote buying. 
The state employees, it's a long enduring kind of presence that you have in the district. It's very, very different. And some parties control this and some don't. So I'm focusing, so when I think of state resources, I'm focusing in this narrow definition of clientelism, is that some, but I'm focusing on sort of really characterizing the menu of brokers, right? Really understanding who they could politicize and why, and right, and why, and, and what points in time do they need this extra help, which is the vote buying broker. It's just the one that you pay. Why would you do that? If you have the policeman on your side, you definitely don't do that. Okay, so that's the simple kind of, you know, descriptive, Part that I'm trying to sort of right, understand in these kind of cases is, you know, sort of right, how this differs. So I'm really leaving apart, right? As Susan Stokes, after that work, I think kind of we have to sort of think of these as different kind of, you know, sort of phenomena. And I'm not sort of right talking about patronage and others, right? I mean, I'm only looking at brokers, the brokers who can observe. That's sort of right the definition. So I think kind of that's. Um, that would be my answer, and I agree kind of with you and, and, and Zibat, although he writes about the secret ballot, the world politics piece. I mean, he has a broader, he wants to explain everything, I, you know, and so on and so forth, and he has the uh, Vime, but the Weimar complicates things, okay, but, but in the end, I mean, sort of his theory is about, um, is also about this, uh, okay, in, uh, in world politics article. And this is, he's drawing the connection between land holding inequality and sort of right and opposition to them through the electoral mechanism. I mean, he's not with Achamoglu, Robinson, and Bosch on the, you know, fear of, he thinks it is the land owners because they control the voters. That's his story. It's a very much an electoral story. So we are on the same page on this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Don, we have to end. Yeah, last okay. And that's sort of right, so I recommend, I mean, if, you know, the students here, if you want to read the best book about 19th century, it's this book by Lavinia Anderson, she's a historian at Berkeley, on sort of right, on 19th century elections, and she's really describing, and the underuse of violence, okay, sort of right, because everything focused in small districts, right, where you kind of observe voters, the main technology of observing the vote is through sort of these kind of, you know, these kind of, you know, very direct brokers. I mean, what do you accomplish with violence? Not much. I mean, kind of, you know, I'm sorry, you can uh, shift to it when the district is larger, when you kind of, you know, sort of right, when you don't have these sort of right monitoring capacities. But you, violence, I mean, she, she makes this point very clear, and we see this sort of right from recent work on, on Britain. So, I mean, there's now a really new book coming out on violence in British elections. It's much more nuanced than what I'm saying, but it's post electoral. It's not. Like, it's not mobilizational, okay? It sort of happens, you know, with the upset candidates, whatever, calling a riot, but it's not, it's not the main technology here of sort of right of kind of competing that, that we see that I'm describing here. So that's a whole, I think it varies across cases. It's definitely not present in the kind of cases and sort of is very well documented in Lavinia Anderson. So we can continue the conversation over why you choose to create them, and thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. Thanks so much. <laughs>